Our next speaker is Evan Brown, Solutions Architect with Google. And his next talk will be Go Build It on a Cluster. One interesting fact about Evan, he once rode his bike from Seattle to Portland in one day. He's really concerned about his green score. You can clap. <laughs> so with that, let's give a big round of applause to Evan Brown. All of these people spent an extra amount of time on these slides. So when we say a big round of applause, you can get up, be crazy, get us kicked out of the hotel. So we'll try it again. Big round of applause for Evan Brown. Thanks for coming, everybody. Uh, this talk is called Go Build It on a Cluster. I wanted to give the most technical talk I possibly could, um, and that would actually have been on how I got Bluetooth headset working with my Linux laptop last week, and it didn't seem relevant. Uh, 2016 is the year of Linux on the laptop. So my name is uh, Evan, and actually there's a quick backstory here. These are the Oregon Mountains in uh, southern New Mexico. I grew up in New Mexico. I'm pretty fond of the place. And there's one other uh, homage that I pay to my home state further on, or a little bit later in the slides. We'll see if you folks get it. Um, so I'm Evan. I work at Google. And I just kind of like bare my soul to everyone here. Um, the fastest way for you to know me is for me to pronounce these two acronyms, Jason and Jif. And Jason is better than YAML, in my opinion. So now, like, you know who I am and what I think about things. And with that said, like, you can choose how you, uh, how you receive the rest of this talk. And I'm actually indoctrinating and raising another human being to believe these facts. That's my, that's my daughter, June. I love her quite a bit. I couldn't resist the opportunity to, to show her to a few hundred people. Yeah, the I. VI, them. <laughs> Then I win back a few of you JSON GIF people with that, maybe. Um, so this is the other homage to my home state of New Mexico. What, what is this? Breaking Bad. So um, throughout the presentation, I really I want to say thank you to a lot of, a lot of different people. Uh, first of all, the conference organizers uh, who put this on and invited me to speak. It's really an honor. Um, and then right now to four people in particular, Don, uh, Brendan, Alex, and Tim. They all work at Google. Um, but just my first experience with Kubernetes was filing an issue. And um, there were a lot of issues already filed, and I was like, oh, the odds of this you know, getting responded to quickly, I don't know, based on experience with other projects. And Tim responded to it in like a couple of minutes. Um, and it's been that way the entire time. So um, I think the technology is great. I'm, I'm a really big believer in the technology. But when you combine the, the community and the maintainers and the, the kind of people that they are, um, it just makes me completely, incredibly optimistic about this project. So thanks, Brendan, and uh, everyone else that has contributed and does this great work. Um, so I want to start off with the story about how Go Build It on a Cluster happened. Uh, I was eating lunch at Google a couple months ago. Um, and this is actually Mountain View, but I live in Seattle. So I'm eating lunch at Google in Seattle. And I look to my left, um, and I see Brad Fitz. And I've been playing around with GoLang for a while. Um, and I really like, I love Go. And I said, hey, Brad, um, you do all this work on the Go standard library. And I think it's awesome, and I just really appreciate the work that you do. And he's like, awesome, thanks. Uh, what's your name? What do you work on? And I'm like, all right, my name's Evan. I'm eating lunch in the cafe. I've been in the cafe since breakfast. Uh, so I spend a lot of time in the, in the cafe, and I'm like on a first name basis with the people in the kitchen. But I don't think that's what he's asking. Um, so what do I do? Ah, containers. And I just kind of blurt out containers. And he's like, cool, what do you do with containers? Uh, DevOps. I DevOps containers. And he's like, all right. Uh, what, so like, how, how do you use them? And at this point, there's two, there's two things left, like two options left. It's either microservices or CI. So I'm like, I do continuous integration with containers. And Brad's like, perfect. Uh, and it, 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 all the stuff that he does with Go, he works on the build system for Go. So pre-commit checks. When code is committed to the Go repository, this massive suite of tests runs against every, everything. And that's the dashboard, uh, build.golang.org. And Brad's like, hey, I really want to get um, the Linux x86 builds running on Kubernetes. I think there's some, like, some wins to be had there. I think that'd be interesting. And Brad's like, it'll take a couple of hours in Brad time. It took me a couple of months. Um, but I was like, yeah, absolutely. Because I actually do care about containers a lot, and I do care about CI quite a bit. So this did kind of fill uh, or provide an interesting opportunity. Super high level about how the build system works. There's a farmer. That's a GCE instance. And the farmer is responsible for pulling the source code repository for changes. It runs this coordinator bin. Uh, and when it detects a change in the Go source repository, it provisions a buildlet. 
Um, this isn't you know, the case for ARM builds, but for Linux x86, it launches a GCE instance, and this build it uh, has a binary that runs on it. It's just a simple HTTP web server. It's built in Go. It receives commands from the former, and it responds with results. Um, and then when it's done, the instance is terminated. This starts to sound a lot like a job, and I'm actually really excited about the jobs API because a lot, kind of a lot of what we built here uh, replicates some of that. So I'm, I'm looking forward to just tearing all of that out. So the farmer can provision a lot of buildlets. Today, um, this happened on Google Compute Engine, and I want to talk to you today about the path to Kubernetes. Um, and this is really, like, to distill this talk, it's about um, how I use the Kubernetes API from a Go client. Some tips and tricks um, and lessons learned that I think if you're, if you're not using kube control, but you're, you're building a system that inter interacts programmatically uh, with the kube API and you don't want to shell out to kube control, some things that you can do that I think will make your life a bit easier. Um, and I'm going to talk about this in four, four areas. So the first is discovery. Um, the second is operations and then efficiency and hygiene. And um, for each of these sections, there's some takeaways, either one or two takeaways, like the core lesson. Um, the, the takeaway for this discovery section um, is the Google.default client library and then cluster.masteroth. So really simplifying how programmatically we discover the clusters available and then how we construct an authenticated API client to communicate with those clusters. I couldn't find a praying gopher. This is a praying otter. Uh, <laughs> this is where the demo starts, live demo. Tethered to an iPhone because why not? Um, so the discovery phase, like when we started this, um, just kind of hacking around, like we need a client that communicates with Kubernetes. Um, we're definitely using Container Engine, Google Container Engine, because we just want a cluster. Like I just want to stand up a cluster that has one node in it to start with, and I want to start scheduling jobs onto that cluster. So um, the GKE or Container Engine APIs are really easy to work with. But what really stands out to me was the Google.default client. If you've ever uh, done OAuth before um, and had a good experience with that, I'd love to talk to, it, talk to you afterwards. I haven't. Um, there's three-legged auth and two-legged auth and JWITs and all of these things. And, and building these clients before was really hard. Um, some of the folks at Google have built this default client implementation that basically looks through, it's intelligent, it looks through your local system, it looks for service accounts, and when it detects credentials, it just uses them automatically, configures uh, the OAuth client for you. So literally one line, and I've got an HTTP client that is authenticated to Container Engine. Um, and the way this works on my laptop is uh, I have G Cloud installed. And G Cloud has already done the OAuth for me. And Google.default client knows that. It finds the credentials file and uses it. When I deploy the same bin to, uh, to a GCE instance, it uses service accounts automatically. So this just works. And it, I cut out like 80 lines of code using this. So that's uh, Google.default client. And then um, this code just lets us uh, get a container service object. And from the container service, we can then interact. And really what's interesting here is clusters Dot list. So we can get the list of clusters in GKE and print the cluster name. So let's just run this guy. We're using the Go dashboard dev, so our dev account for the Go build system. And we've got one cluster. It's called um, buildlets. So that's the, the first step of discovery is where are my clusters? Like what's the landscape of Kubernetes clusters available? Um, the second step is literally called uh, step two. I'm going to knock this out. And step two is all about how do we, now that we have a cluster, um, how do we, we know the clusters, how do we connect to them? So um, the clusters API gives us two or three really important things here, and that's the certificate information for the cluster. So we can get the cert, the key, and the CA from the Kubernetes cluster. And from that, we can construct a TLS configuration. And um, with that TLS config, we can create an HTTP client, the Kube HTTP client here. And now we're good to go. We can start making API calls against this Kubernetes cluster. So discover the cluster, configure the client all programmatically. We get this, the root CA installed. We're good to go. And in this demo, I can just um, get the slash nodes URL. 
Um, and I would say, as an aside, generally, the, the Kubernetes API is pretty incredible, su super easy to work with, um, and the Swagger docs are great. So uh, let's see if I list the nodes here. This should work. I actually don't know how many nodes we're running right now. And let's count those nodes. I need to probably know how much money we're spending. Let's see, my JQ foo. Mm. Ah. So 10. So we're running 10 nodes in this dev cluster right now. So communicating with the API um, is incredibly easy using Container Engine and uh, Google.Default Client. Big fan. And thanks to uh, Berju and Andrew, uh, the folks who, have wor who worked to make Google.Default Client, um, it's saved a lot of people a lot of time. Operations. And I'm not calling this DevOps, but just generally operations. And this is a super deep topic that we could spend probably a day talking about. But just my experience uh, starting out with this project and, and the things that mattered to me to get things off the ground. And there's one takeaway that I learned, and that's nurture your cattle. So we've all heard the pets versus cattle analogy. Um, my analogy is um, not like running a ranch with thousands of cattle, but trying to build a ranch with my first cow. And really, that's where we all start when you're building an application. You've got this little calf, and it's your only calf, and then this or my only pod, and it gets sick. Like, you want to understand why it's sick, and you want to make it better. And actually, even when you do have a large ranch with thousands of cows, and a cow gets sick, like, you kind of need to figure out what's going on. That's how mad cow disease started. So um, this is all to say that Cube Control Exec makes it so easy to just hop into a running container and get shell access. And on day one, when I'm trying to get this, when I was trying to get this build system going and things weren't working, cube control exec, boom, I'm in, and I diagnosed the problem like that. Very, very fancy. Um, there's a lot of different commands in cube control, a lot of really incredible things you can do. Um, a shout out to Kelsey Hightower, a talk that he gave a couple months ago, um, turned me on. I had no idea that cube control proxy existed. So cube control proxy opens up like localhost 8001 and proxies to the cube API master. So you can use curl or just hop in your browser and, uh, and make requests against the, the Kubernetes API. And from a, like getting off the ground, building your cattle ranch, building your application, you just want to understand and get a feel for the API. And I use the Swagger docs all the time to do this, but you want to see the real data. Like I, I launched this pod, and what does the state look like? Um, and I can get that right in my browser with curl. And it just makes the development experience. Like I've, I've done a lot of dev on a lot of different systems and never had these kinds of tools that just um, were so conducive uh, to that working. Last two things, efficiency and hygiene. And this is a lot of, um, I think, some of what we had to do to not implement jobs, but um, make a job-like or a batch-like system work. And um, when I say like job or batch-like, we, we talked about the farmer the main controller instance that starts up and it looks for source code changes and it provisions a build it. So it launches a pod into a cluster. And there's a lot of things that can happen when you launch a pod. Um, it goes into the pending state first and then hopefully it goes into the running state, but it could go into the failed state. It could go into the running state and then it could go into the failed state. Um, it could go into the running state and stay in the running state, but th there's no containers running. So understanding after you launch a pod what's happening is important. Um, and generally speaking, we, we care about, in the, in the go build system, timing out and moving on. So we, we set some really tight thresholds for like, uh, a pod should start up in five seconds. And actually, as an anecdote, a GCE instances boot very fast. Um, and I think the mean boot time was about 45 seconds for GCE. And we're getting pod boot times here in like less than a second, super fast. Um, but we still care. Like We have a, a threshold of three minutes. And if the, if the build it server isn't responding and doing work within three minutes, we want to start over. Um, so how do we do that efficiently? Um, the takeaway here is, for us, was monitoring pod state using the watch API. So I said the Kubernetes API was really great. There's um, an, a watch API that allows you to do basically a hanging get or a long pull. And Kubernetes will just stream st the, the status of the object that you're watching. So in our case, for the go build system, we launch a build it pod. And we want to know what state it's in, 
so, so that we can either terminate it and start over, or if it's running, we can start sharding tests and, and retrieving results. Um, and the first iteration of this just pulled. Like we would do the cube control or the, the cube API get, parse the result, and then do it again in like three seconds. Um, so when we implemented the watch API, it was another you know, surprisingly easy thing to get going. Um, I cut out th two steps last night. There were some boring things, step three and four. You wouldn't have liked them. But you're going to like step five. So um, at this point, we're actually using the, the, the actual Go build library in the demo. So uh, get cube client gets us the cube client, does all that discovery stuff. And then we uh, come and call run pod. And it's not a super interesting pod. Um, we've got our pod definition here. And I think kind of an interesting aside is our pod infrastructure is still version controlled, right? This is, it's not a, a YAML manifest, but it's a Go file. So our pod declarations are, um, are still in version control. But so I'm going to schedule this pod, and then I'm going to watch it. And the watch interface is pretty straightforward. Um, we call the watch API, and then we just use a buffered reader to read from the response body. And Kubernetes uh, sends a carriage return with each response. So we can use a buffered reader, look for a new line, and we know that we've got um, a status update from the watch API. So this should just launch a pod and start watching uh, for that pod. It's modified. It's going to fail intentionally. Please fail. Aha. All right. So it failed. Um, there's a problem here with the way this is implemented, because we've just got this hanging get, and there's really no way to shut that down. And for one, like one instance of this, that's not a big deal. But when you're running a big distributed build system that's doing hundreds of builds, you can't have these like abandoned HTTP connections all over the place. Um, my trusty shell script to nuke, the pods will show like what delete looks like. So we get these events like rapid fire, get them really quickly. Um, so that's the basics of the watch API, but what's even more important than that is how we would interrupt a watch, or generally how we would cancel some long-running process. And you end up doing a lot of these with Go routines, right? Like, you have a lot of Go routines that are running, doing these things, and you need a way to sort of, like, shut these processes down. There's a really good Go blog post um, about building pipelines, and they talk about using channels and closing a channel to indicate shutdown. Um, there's a more formalized way of doing that now, and that is the, uh, in the hygiene section here, context. So uh, there's a context library and then the context HTTP, which is compatible with net HTTP, that allows you to define a context which has a timeout or can be explicitly canceled and integrates with the HTTP library. So you can create this context, fire off your Go routines that make all of these HTTP requests and long running requests. And if you decide as kind of the, the provisioner of all of these things that the job is over, you close the context. It manages all of that, the channel closing implementation, and HTTP connections are closed cleanly. Um, and it's, we used it extensively in this, uh, in this system. So let's take a look at how that works. Uh, so we've got the same run pod. And the only thing different here is we're creating a context with a timeout. Context.background is just the parent context. So it's like a base starting context. And we're saying this context has five seconds to run. Um, the context library implements the countdown or the timer or however they do it. Um, and we call the watch with the context. And the watch simply looks for context.done and closes the response body. So we should see a five-second timeout here. The way we use this specifically in the build system is uh, we've got 300 seconds to wrap up, and uh, everything gets a context. And the, the process that starts all of these little Go routines um, manages that. So things will shut down automatically in 300 seconds and be cleaned up. So that's helpful um, that we did it in five seconds. But there's also explicit cancellation available in context. And explicit cancellation allows you, it's pretty straightforward, to say, you know, we're actually done. I want to cancel. And in, in the case of the, the watch pod status API, if a pod fails, 
we're done watching. Like, we don't want to uh, keep the HTTP long pull going. We're going to move on and try again, but we want to close and shut everything down. So, under the basic implementation there, it's really straightforward. We just range over the watch. Um, so watch pod returns a channel, and the channel just streams these status updates that get returned by the, the API. Um, and if we get a status of failed, then we're done. Uh, we delete the pod and move on. And I'll say, like, the first code review I did with Brad, it was just, like, channels everywhere. Everything was a channel, like, channels of channels. And um, I got a lot, of, a lot of helpful information from him about not abusing channels. Thank you. <laughs> Nuke demo. So we create the pod. We're going to watch it fail. And when it fails, we call cancel on the context, and we're done. So this is really about hygiene, keeping clean, managing the things that you're creating, because when you do it at scale, it can get out of hand. Um, the API makes it, again, really easy to do this. So I do, the last shout out I want to give is to Fatih. Does anyone know what he does? He built the Vim Go plugin. Um, so it makes working with Go in Vim it's just incredible. It's really, really good. Um, so thanks for the, this is everyone in the open source community that's contributing to this. You all make this possible. Um, Going.org slash x slash build, all the code's there. I'm Evan Brown. Look forward to talking with you all uh, the rest of the week. Thanks very much. Oh, yeah. Q we have time for Q&A? Yeah, go ahead. All right. We have Qs. I have A's. I think while, while we're doing the, the laptop setup, I get your tactics here, MC. You're good at this. Questions? Could be about New Mexico, or Breaking Bad, or Go, or Kubernetes. Evan. Yay. Question. Yeah, so Repeat the question. The question was, um, if you're not using Go, how do you get access to these bindings? So a really great thing about these client libraries, well, the, the great thing and maybe not the not so great thing is that they're auto-generated from, a, from a, a service descriptor. So they're, they're, at, they're pretty low level is what that boils down to. But they're available in like Python and Ruby and Java uh, and a, f a few other different languages. So the, the coverage is actually pretty broad. So that's the advantage. The disadvantage is you do quite a bit of low-level work. So kind of a next step for me, now that we've got the build system where it is, is to take at least the Go library, these higher-level constructs like run pod, watch, and get them out into a more a curated, more opinionated client library. And then hopefully we'll see that start to happen as well with uh, some of the other client libraries or SDKs. Yeah. Exactly. And that was kind of in it, because I've used cube control the whole time. Thinking about it from like inverting that a little bit was, is really powerful. Yeah. What resources did you use to learn Go? What resources did I use to learn Go? Um, I used the Programming and Go book by Caleb. Um, and then I came up with like two projects that I thought would like two CLIs and just wrote them. That was it. I, I love building tools that only I use. <laughs> yeah. All right. Question? Last question. Yes. So the question was, does the context close take care of both ends of the connection on the API server or on the client? I don't know. It, it closes the response body. On the on the client side, um, I'm not sure how that ha how that is handled on the server side, but we could look into that with using the proxy and, and doing a little TCP dump magic. So I'll check that out and let you know. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>